Hello and welcome. I could start this video by talking about the uh, Great Lakes surrounding the state of Michigan. Lake Erie, Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, and Lake Superior. Their relationship with the state economy, ecology, weather, etc, etc. But in reality, I'm simply going to drive from uh, lake to lake, collect a sample, analyze it, and compare results. So there's a lot of road ahead. Let's get sampling. One of the easily recognizable feature on the North American continent is the Great Lakes region. 1.1 billion years ago, a rift opened and began to split North America in three. In a similar way, Iceland is currently being split. Lava started filling the gap where Lake Superior currently lies. This went on for 15 million years, and for some reason, the separation stopped. Lava cooled, and erosion took hold eventually turning igneous rock into mud and sand, and finally, sedimentary rock. The basin of the soft material left behind was easy to plow for the glacier that covered the area starting two million years ago, on and off until about 20,000 years ago. And when the ice finally melted away, Lake Superior, Michigan, and Lake Ontario were born. This crack in the Earth's crust is still visible on some geological maps. Lake Erie and Lake Huron were basin weakened by ancient riverbed filled with soft rocks and sediments, easily carved out by glaciers during the Pleistocene. The lower peninsula of Michigan is made of harder bedrock that funneled the ice towards the present-day lake basin. Today, almost 5,000 rivers, streams, and smaller lakes continuously feed water into the Great Lakes. Lake Superior flows into Lake Michigan and Lake Huron, which in turn feed Lake Erie, and finally, Lake Ontario and the Atlantic Ocean. Over 250 species of fish, 300 species of birds, and many other native wildlife make the area the largest freshwater ecosystem in the world. 35 million people in eight states and a Canadian province rely on six quadrillion gallons of fresh water for drinking, transportation, recreation, power, agriculture, etc., etc. But despite their size, the Great Lakes are vulnerable to pollution. Starting in the 1960s, Alfred Beaton monitored the salinity of the lake by collecting samples and measuring chloride and TDS values. This approximation gives a conservative estimate of the pollution in the lake, and Alfred Beaton was the first to recognize this. His alarming results led to the signing in 1972 of the US-Canada Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement which had the effect of reducing the phosphate content in laundry detergent and many upgrades to wastewater treatment plant. 50 years later, I wanted to check the ionic pollution of the lake around the state of Michigan where I live, which is why Lake Ontario is not included in this short study. Although the state is strongly tied to the lake's health, Michigan and water have a complicated relationship. But beyond the politics and the headlines, let's take a look at the science and some common pollution factors and my analysis. After sampling each lake, I looked at the total dissolved solid, or TDS, which affect the taste of the water, chloride for the general index of industrial pollution, sodium for road salt intrusion, too much calcium can lead to whitening, and high turbidity, which is a nuisance to fish and some algae. Sulfate contribute to the same calcium deposit, and high sulfate can be the source of toxic effluent in reducing conditions. Phosphates for the biomass expansion. Magnesium for its relationship and somewhat constant ratio with calcium. TOC for organic pollution like benzene and diesel. CODs goes along with a TOC and is a good organic contamination index. And finally, trace metals to check the cumulative effect of industrial heavy metal impurities. Since I'm already set up for this, I use my ion chromatograph for chloride, sulfate, sodium, magnesium, and calcium. But I also use this portable BAWD3 spectrum water quality detector for TOC, COD, and TDS. For low range phosphate, I use the uh, HANA HI713, which I first checked with the phosphate standard and got reliable results. Trace metals were looked at first on my mass spectrometer and confirmed with a professional lab. Now each lake have a different water retention time and volume that must be taken into consideration when looking at the total pollution. This is a representation of the lake volume, and on this scale, 
one gallon is equal to 1,000 cubic kilometers of water. So that and other factors like industrial activity and human presence also play an obvious role in the following results. Lake Erie is the shallowest and warmest lake with an average depth of only 19 meters. Lake Erie has also the shortest water retention time of only 2.7 years. And this is also the most industrialized lake. And the analysis invariably confirms this. Almost every single data point is systematically higher in Lake Erie, sometimes by a lot, like the iron concentration often found with manganese, most common metals, copper, nickel, and zinc. Vanadium is also far more concentrated in Lake Erie. And finally, chloride, phosphate, and yes, lead as well. With the notable exception of calcium and carbonates, both highest in Lake Huron. With calcium and magnesium, we can calculate the hardness of water. The hardness is the ability of water to leave residue when drying and diminish the effectiveness of soap. This map shows the area of hard water and the red part of Michigan is where I sampled Lake Huron. Lake Michigan and Lake Huron are connected through the Mackinac Strait in the northern lower peninsula and are really the same body of water. Therefore, it would be expected the water chemistry be very similar in both samples. Lithium, boron, thorium, molybdenum, aluminum, and carbonates have comparable concentrations despite the 180 plus miles separating the two sampling points. But there were a few exceptions. I measured twice as much organic matter in Lake Huron than Lake Michigan. I believe the sampling date in late July and the proximity to a beach has a lot to do with the results. Perhaps for the same reason, potassium is also higher in my Lake Huron sample. Potassium is far less common than sodium in freshwater system because the continental plate where the lakes are located is mostly made of potassium poor granite. There was also more antimony in my Michigan sample. I would have a very hard time explaining this and can only speculate why that is. I do, however, have confidence in this result because tin often associated with antimony and is also in slightly higher concentration in Lake Michigan. If you have any inside knowledge, I'd be curious to find out. Sulfates and chlorides are extremely common in natural water, but often in a similar concentration with chloride usually in excess over sulfate. Such is not the case in the Michigan water sample probably because of the presence of gypsum on the beach I collected my sample. Finally, phosphate were the lowest in Lake Michigan. Lake Superior is well known for its tantrum. Collecting a sample was a bit of a fight. I had to give some of my dignity in exchange for a few milliliters of its capricious waters. Lake Superior consistently gives the lowest concentration of almost everything. It is by far the cleanest lake. That should not be a surprise considering its volume and the low human activity surrounding it. Just like Lake Michigan, Lake Superior display a higher concentration of sulfate over chloride. It also has more aluminum than in both Lake Huron and Michigan. I had a brief moment of agitation when I looked at the lead isotope ratio. Because of the water retention in excess of 100 years in Lake Superior, things that fell in the lake long before the nuclear age could display a more natural isotopic ratio than current common lead. Although possible, it is far more likely the instrument is not able to get a consistent signal during the analysis. When measuring sub part per trillion level of lead, the mass spectrometer should be tuned to a higher dwell time for a longer acquisition and better certainty. But this is beyond the scope of this video. Also, nitrates were only detected in Lake Superior and Lake Michigan. As part of the nitrogen cycle, nitrates are the final product of decomposition of ammonia from sewage and decaying plants and animals. The water retention time in both lakes is longer than in Lake Huron and Lake Erie, so maybe it has not been flushed out as quickly and can be detected in mid proper billion range. All of these results are very interesting and allow a basic overview of the lake chemistry. Most of my results were expected and consistent with what is known of the lake composition and concentration. Lake Superior is still very clean despite the weather during sampling. 
which could have mixed in more particles and skewed my results. The shallow rocky beach I sampled Lake Michigan from is probably not a representative area. Midsummer is also not the best time of the year to sample Lake Huron. And the western side of Lake Erie might be the dirtiest. Finally, let's not forget the impossibly small concentration of most of these analytes. For example, arsenic, which is 1.8 part per billion at its highest in Lake Erie. To put it another way, if part per billion were seconds, arsenic would be at 1.8 seconds in a 31 year sample. As it is with most study, one or a few samples is usually not enough to get a big picture. And with more sampling over periods of times, a more complete story can emerge. Also, I mostly look at the inorganic chemistry, which should uh, never be the sole driver to determine if the water is safe to swim in or eat the fish caught from it. And I hope nobody is uh, drinking the water straight from the lake. As the western U.S. suffer extended drought, the Great Lakes could become an important source of fresh water to millions in the not-so-distant future. Constructive criticism is always welcome. Thanks for watching. Damn it!